Just because you don't feel convicted about something doesn't mean that it's not wrong. It's time to stop choosing the world and God. It's not loving as a Christian for me to look at another Christian and say, yeah, keep sinning. That's fine. I want young women to know that they do not have to live like the world. It's not legalism to obey the Lord. It's the truth. God was so thoughtful and intentional with every single thing that he planned out. Do you not think that he was also that intentional when he created you? Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you are new here, my name is Gabrielle and I am so happy that you are either here for the first time or coming back to my channel. If you haven't checked out my previous two videos, feel free to go check those out. I will link them in this video, but I did a girl chat video last week and then the week before I talked about why I no longer celebrate Halloween as a Christian. And this week we are going to be talking about a very nuanced and layered topic, which is when someone says, I don't feel convicted by that and the importance of obeying God as a Christian in our everyday lives and how that displays our love for him to the world. The reason I'm making this video and what I wanna talk about today is that we cannot actively be followers of Christ and love him and profess our faith in him to the world if we are not obeying him. Because something that has really stood out to me in a lot of conversations that I've had with people who are both believers and non-believers alike, or people who are even in different religions, is they'll say, well, you know, I like the concept of Christianity, or I kind of like what it stands for, or, you know, I would be interested in it if there weren't so many Christians with double standards who say one thing and do another, who profess that Jesus is Lord and then disobey him with their actions because people are just two-faced within the Christian community. We have this like watered down Southern gospel that says, go to church on Sunday, but don't obey God with the rest of your life. And that's something that like, I wanna be a part of in my generation, like waking people up to the reality that like, it's time to stop being on two sides of the coin. It's time to stop choosing the world and God because it says in scripture that we cannot align ourselves with the world and with God at the same time, we have to choose. And that's kind of why I'm making this video today because how many times have you heard someone say to you, oh, I'm not convicted by that, but it wasn't a conviction issue that they were discussing. It was something blatantly laid out in scripture that is wrong, that is a sin, and that does not honor the Lord. Now, I believe that there are certain things that are conviction issues, such as how you dress, maybe the movies or shows you watch, or maybe what musical artists you enjoy. Things like that are personal convictions. What is not a personal conviction is the things that are clearly laid out in scripture for us to obey that God has spoken through the people that he used to write the Bible, which is the inerrant word of God. If you were anything like me, a zillennial, cause I was born in 98, so I'm like in between millennial and Gen Z, I feel like something that we are teetering on the cusp of, right, is the generation before us, the way that they were raised and the way that they were taught as far as biblical topics was very do or die in almost like a mean and harsh way instead of, hey, this is the truth, this is loving to tell you the truth and here's why I'm telling you this, it was like, you're going to hell if you don't listen to me right now. In response to that, I think we have created our own movement of progressive Christianity of saying, hey, that was wrong and we need to love people and we need to be there to support people and we can't just like shun all these different groups. Like Jesus would love everyone. So that's kind of my first point I wanna get into is just talking about progressive Christianity because it has definitely seeped into our modern day church almost without us realizing it, to be honest, because it comes from a very valid place of love and of acceptance and of real people being hurt by the church or by other people in their lives and them finding a way to reconcile their faith with the hurt that they have experienced. So if you are like me and you're wondering what in the world is progressive Christianity, I want to lay out a few things for you. And let me be clear, I'm not making this video or talking about progressive Christianity to bash a certain sect of Christianity or to say, oh my gosh, these are terrible people. 
I'm bringing this to light because it ties in with obeying the Lord and the truth being revealed because the truth will set us free. So there's a couple of things that progressive Christianity holds as tenets that they believe in. The first thing is that they do not believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. They do not take it literally. So they kind of look at the Bible as an instruction manual and they look at Jesus as a morally great teacher who has a lot of really wonderful principles that they can incorporate in their lives, but they do not look at scripture as the inerrant word of God. So they are saying basically because humans wrote it, which God used those humans to write it, that there are going to be errors and contradictions within scripture. So we can't fully obey or rely on everything that is in scripture. So that is tenant number one. And I'm not going to hit everything in this video. I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights as it relates to what I'm talking about. So the second tenant for progressive Christianity is actually kind of what I already talked about. Now they don't say, you know, like Jesus isn't the author of our salvation, but they don't focus on Jesus's atonement or his divinity like traditional Christianity does. Instead, they focus on him as a moral teacher. And another thing that I forgot to say is that they really view the Bible as a historical and metaphorical book that can kind of, you know, like be applied to certain situations in our everyday lives, but definitely that needs to adapt and conform to our modern society. So the third tenet for progressive Christianity is that there is no actual heaven and hell and that we will actually all be justified through Christ in the end. And this is based off of Romans 5 18, which says, so then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. This passage is not saying or implying that we are all saved. This is saying that salvation is available for all of us if we choose that, but we can also choose to deny Jesus and not be united with him in heaven. I really believe that interpreting Romans 5, 18 as some sort of bumper sticker for, oh, we're actually all gonna be saved in the end, and so we don't actually have to choose Jesus. We don't have to surrender our lives to God. We don't have to surrender our sin to him. We don't have to make a change in our lives. There's no sacrificial love there on our end then it really nullifies the sacrificial love that was Jesus coming to the earth, dying on the cross and taking on all the sins of the world in that moment, he felt every single pain. Tenant number four from progressive Christianity is not actually a tenant of progressive Christianity, but just something that I kind of culminated from everything that I have been reading, which is essentially cherry picking the gospel and idolizing ourselves above Christ, meaning that well, since we know better than God, we know that he definitely didn't write the Bible through humans. It was flawed. And so we can't actually rely on what it says. We definitely know that our sins don't carry as much gravity as he says they do in scripture. So we can excuse all of them and that somehow we definitely have the right to alter scripture to fit with our modern day society. And that even coming out of my mouth terrifies me. If we do that, we take away the validity of scripture and how it applies to our Christian walk. Like I said, I understand the heart behind progressive Christianity, which is to be an advocate and to be loving and to show support for marginalized groups, which I believe we should do all of these things in addition to obeying God. It You, you can't separate the two, they all go together. Satan has used progressive Christianity to get well-meaning, kind, lovely people who are Christians deceived into excusing sin and into affirming sin within our society. My sin is not my identity and I'm not going to alter scripture to justify it how I want to live my life. One of the main reasons I have such an issue with progressive Christianity twisting scripture is they twist the covenant of marriage, which God intended to be between a man and a woman. Why did God make this? It's because he made a man and a woman perfectly together to love each other and to have children and also to enjoy each other. Of course, I don't believe that marriage and sex is just made 
for procreation, but I believe that it is a beautiful sacrificial covenant that reflects Christ's love for us to the world. And of course, that has been perverted by our society and by our fallen nature. But within progressive Christianity, they affirm the LGBTQ plus movement and they think that it's okay for you to be a Christian and to also not honor God with your body at the same time. Of course, this is not the only sin in the Bible. It's not loving as a Christian for me to look at another Christian and say, yeah, keep sinning. That's fine. I affirm you and I love you and I believe that you can walk out your relationship with the Lord in that way. Hey, I love you, but this is not your identity. Your identity is in Christ, your new creation, just like me. I have multiple sins that I struggle with and so do all of my friends and family, but our identity is not those sins. Our identity is as a Christian, as a believer, as a son or daughter of Jesus Christ. I think that Satan has fed my generation a lie that our identity is in our sexuality and maybe if you are not a believer that might be the case for you but if you are your identity is so much bigger than that your identity is to be a messenger of God to the world to share his love and his salvation with other people that are lost and I don't think it's right as a Christian to affirm anyone's sin but on the toxic side of Christianity we like to cling to this and say like oh my gosh these people are so awful so wrong whatever 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 that's not loving, that's not kind. You need to pray for people instead of being so freaking hateful. As we begin to compromise one small thing after one small thing after one small thing and we say, oh, the Bible isn't the inerrant word of God. Oh, did God really say that? Oh, God didn't really mean that. Oh, well, in this context, not that. Then we begin to lose the very fabric of our faith, of our morals, of what God commanded us to do. And I have been in a situation, which leads me into my second point, which is we can have a seared conscience, which leads to us not feeling convicted about certain things. I've been in a place where I was like, you know what? I don't care. I like my sin. I'm okay with it. It's serving me. I don't want to stop, which I think is like a really hard self-evaluation to take a look at when you're struggling with a sin and say like, do I actually wanna surrender this to God or do I just feel guilty? Because you're not gonna be able to stop something if you just feel guilty. You're only gonna be able to stop if one, you surrender to the Lord and number two, you actually feel convicted and like sick on your stomach. Like you do not want to be a part of this or have this be a part of your life anymore. Like you're like, no, I hate this sin. Because if you still secretly love it, it's not going anywhere. It's still gonna be a part of your life. And through repetition comes a seared conscience. The more I cuss, the more I don't care. The more I yell at someone, the more I don't care. The more I cut someone off in traffic, the more I don't care. The more I'm rude to my spouse, the more I don't care. The more I have sex before marriage, the more I don't care, the more I watch crazy movies that have like sex and violence and cussing and all kinds of stuff in it, the more I don't care. And I also just wanna say as part of this video, just because you don't feel convicted about something doesn't mean that it's not wrong. And doesn't mean that God didn't explicitly say in scripture for us to not do it. Just because you have found solace in whatever sin you were choosing to participate in, doesn't make it okay and doesn't make it so that God is suddenly saying, yep, that's amazing. You do you, boo, and you gratify the desires of your heart and I actually don't care about holiness or you obey me anymore. You don't get to make up your own rules. You need to be reading scripture and following what the Lord says. So I just wanna put in that side note, if someone says to you, well, that might be wrong to you, but I don't feel convicted about that, but it's clearly something that the Bible says is wrong. I would try to have another conversation with that person. And if that person is a close friend to you, level with them and say, girl, be so for real, what is happening? And then if they still like are not repentant or like seeing your side of things, you honestly might need to take a step back and another reflection or another evaluation of that relationship and say like, is this friendship benefiting me in the sense that it's helping me get closer to the Lord? Or is it like confusing my mind and clouding my judgment and pushing me into a space that I know I should not be in? First Timothy four verse one through two speaks perfectly to the topic of having a seared conscience. It says, but the spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as a branding iron. Paul knew that the church in Ephesus was being threatened by false teachers and doctrines seeping into their church community. And so it says, it is not enough that a teacher appears
appears to know what he is talking about is disciplined or moral or says that he is speaking of God. If his words contradict the Bible, his teaching is false. Such false teaching can be very direct or extremely subtle. So this just ties back into progressive Christianity and having a seared conscience because it's like, it's such a subtle thing that seeps in little by little by little where we start compromising what the Lord has commanded us to do. And isn't that just like the enemy to be so sneaky? If you don't feel convicted by something and you're kind of in a place where you're honestly like, I don't even recognize this person anymore. I would begin to pray for like just a tenderness of heart and that God would open the veil of your eyes and show you the areas in your life where you could be honoring him with your body and with your mind. Romans 1 28 verse 32 is very powerful because I believe like it through repeated sin and through blatantly disobeying what God is telling us to do, our hearts can be hardened and turned away from him. It says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slander, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, trustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them, which is why I refuse within the Christian community to give approval to anyone who is living out any lifestyle contrary to scripture. Now, if you are not a believer, this does not apply to you. Like, like, I am not going to sit here and call you out or anything. Like, unless you have had a transformative encounter with the Lord and you are living for him, then that would be a different conversation. But if you are not, then I am not going to sit here and bash you on the internet. Another great verse is found in Titus, which was written from Paul to Titus. So in chapter one, he says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed guys the outward fruit of our lives is a testament to where we are at in our relationship with the Lord. Of course, we are going to sin. Of course, we are going to be imperfect because we are human. We are not God. But the whole point of being a Christian is to reflect him and his love back to the world and to be a good example and to be above reproach and to have fruit overflowing in our lives of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. It literally says both their mind and their conscience are defiled. And I believe through repetition and through even the influences that we have in our lives, our conscience can become defiled as we continue to accept something over and over and over and over and over again, which is literally why I'm making this video and why I'm talking about this because I want young women to know that they do not have to live like the world. They do not have to conform to societal norms, that they can live a life that honors the Lord and is actually a really beautiful and freeing thing. It's not an oppressive thing. It's not a legalistic thing. It's a awakening to a depth and a beauty of a relationship with the Lord that cannot be found in the world. And the last thing I would say to someone who says, oh, I don't feel convicted by that about a blatant sin that is in the Bible is that obeying God is the ultimate act of love that we can show to him. How are we supposed to obey God if we're just a human? Well, we have the helper, the Holy Spirit. John 14 verse 14 through 17, which says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So we cannot overcome sin or obey the Lord on our own volition. We cannot do that. We can do that with the helper of the Holy Spirit who reminds us of right and wrong, who gives us supernatural strength to overcome struggles that we are dealing with. Obeying God is not only an act of love, but it's also an act of faith, which we have to have in our relationship with Jesus. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going, but he still had faith to obey the Lord in an unknown situation. And it's such a lesson for us to learn as believers. Like we may not know where God is calling us or where he wants us to go, but if he says, 
no, not that. We need to say, okay, no, not that, and keep moving. If he says, yeah, try that, we need to do that. We need to follow him immediately. So now let's get into it. What are the sins that the Bible says are wrong and that we should not participate in? Keep in mind, please, I am not God, so please do not take my word as Bible, but read the Bible for yourself and discern that with the Lord. But here are some things that the Lord specifically condones in scripture that we do not get to decide, oh, hey, that's actually good for me. It's actually benefiting me, so I'm just gonna keep doing it. The first thing is God gossip and slander. Now this was something very convicting for me a couple of years ago because I have always been very prone to gossip, you know, just sitting around with your friends from 10 years ago talking about the same old, same old, or talking about, oh, so-and-so did that to me, or in a sense, like turning things to say, well, I'm not actually gossiping about this person. I'm just talking about the experience I went through, but I digress. It's still something that the Lord is working on in my heart. It, it's like, it's not fun and it's not cute to sit around and tear people down. It's not fun and cute to talk about the tea going on in someone else's life. It, there's so many other worthwhile things to talk about within a friendship or within a relationship other than slandering someone else. And I fully know that God put that in the Bible for a reason. The next thing is sexual immorality. I'm not even going to put premarital sex in here because it could literally be anything. It could be that, or it could be other sexual acts if you're not within the covenant of marriage, or it could be looking at porn, or it could be cheating on your significant other, or it could be lusting after someone. It's really as simple as that in the Bible, or it could be a sexual relationship that is not within the design that God created in scripture, which is between a man and a woman. And the Bible doesn't say, flee from sex before marriage. It says, flee from sexual immorality of all kinds. <laughs> all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but this sin is within our bodies, which are temples of the living God, which I feel like is something that we skip over as Christians. We're like, well, I want to justify my sin. So I'm going to keep doing this because it's what's best for me. Okay. It's not about what's best for us. It's about what honors the Lord. Our bodies are literally living temples. And if you go back to the Old Testament and read about the specifications for building the temple and building the altar and building the Ark of the Covenant and building the inner rooms of the temple, God was so detailed and meticulous and organized and thoughtful and intentional with every single thing that he planned out. Do you not think that he was also that intentional when he created you? Do you not think he created you for a purpose? So why are you not honoring God with your body? I have been there. I have been in a long season where I did not honor God with my body and it drove me away from the Lord and it put me in a place that I never ever want to be in ever again in my life. The next few things, are drunkenness. Now the Bible doesn't say, oh, it's a sin for you to drink. It says, don't get drunk. So you should not be drinking with the intention of, oh, I want to feel tipsy or, oh, I want to get drunk tonight or, oh, I want to black out and not remember anything the next morning. No, like as a Christian, okay, yeah, have a glass of wine with your dinner or have a little drink with, you know, friends or whatever, but don't make it an idol and be aware of the room that you're in too. Like, be aware of certain people's sensitivities and respect that because you do not want to be the cause of another person stumbling into sin. Like if they are more prone towards alcohol addiction or drug addiction, like no. And also, I mean, it's not even on this list, but drugs, I feel like that goes without saying, like you are defaming and destroying the temple that God gave you. Drugs do not edify our bodies at all. They don't make us healthier. They don't enhance our lives in any way. They ruin our bodies. There's a reason why certain organs in our body break down over time after a long sustained period of abuse or of alcohol or drug addiction. Like there's, it's not just, oh, whoops, that had adverse effects. Like that is the consequence of sin. The next ones are greed and pride and blasphemy. Like it is a sin to be prideful, to think that you are better than someone, to think that like they are on a different level than you, to be greedy with your money. Like God wants us to be giving of our resources and not to hoard it all within ourselves. Occult practices. I feel like that goes without saying that is totally misaligned and not a part of anything that the Lord would have for us. And the next one that I'll touch on really fast is cussing or cursing. Depending on where you're from in the United States, you might call it something different. Our modern church has created such a convenient excuse to say, oh, well, cussing's not actually wrong. If you look at the context of the Bible, that's not what they actually meant. And so I'm going to justify it if I'm saying it in a fun and silly way, then it's not actually wrong 
wrong for me. And I just want to say that could not be further from the truth. No matter what was considered a curse word when the Bible was written or now, if something is deemed as unwholesome by the vast majority of our society, then that is not something that should be coming out of our mouths. Because in scripture, it literally says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful and beneficial for building others up. And this doesn't mean, oh, don't talk down to people, just encourage them. It means that, but it also means don't call them names or don't blaspheme the name of the Lord. Don't put them down in a way that is derogatory and deemed as foul by our society. A verse that I absolutely love when it comes to this topic is James 3, verse 9 through 10, which says, with our tongue, we praise the Lord our Father, and with it, we curse other human beings who are made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing my brothers and sisters. It should not be this way. How convicting is that? Like, I have struggled with cussing a good majority of my life. It was something where, you know, I thought it was silly and cute when I was a kid. I was like, my mom doesn't know what she's talking about. It's not bad for me. And then I got into college and I was like, screw her, I can do what I want and I'm just gonna continue this. And then I got a little bit older and I was a little convicted. I was like, okay, let me stop doing this. And the people that I worked with at like Wendy's and Target and whatever, they knew like, oh, they would apologize to me if they accidentally cursed around me. They'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I didn't mean to say that. And then as I got older, I just got around people who would excuse this sin and say, oh, it's not a big deal. Oh, it really doesn't matter. Oh, we don't need to honor the Lord with our speech. And it's like actually mind boggling that that started to infiltrate my mind and I started cussing a lot. It was just a part of my speech around certain people, even with my husband. Like when I get angry, it has a tendency to pour out of my mouth because out of the heart, so the mouth speaks. It's the overflow of our heart. As believers, we need to be on guard against the schemes of the world. We need to be aware that the enemy doesn't want us to have convictions about things. He wants us to keep sinning. He wants us to conform to the world. He wants us to look identical to the world and nothing like Christ but Christ wants us to look like a reflection of him and like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And if we are blending in with the world and drinking and cussing and partying and having sex and gossiping about people and lying and slandering and being prideful and being jealous and all these things, we don't look like Christ at all. We look exactly like the world and who's going to know the difference? Who's going to know where the light source is coming from and who's going to know that they need to turn to the Lord if we look no different. Friends, I am making this video not to make you feel bad, not to shame you in your sin, but to call you to a higher standard as a Christian, to call you to better because the Lord wants better for you. Guys, the only way that we can feel convicted of our sin, the only way that we can be genuinely repentant is if we are in the word. If we are reading scripture and seeing God's specific commands and seeing the lessons that he is teaching us through scripture, and if we truly believe that the Bible is the inherent word of God. And the only way is if we have godly counsel around us who is pointing us back to the Lord and who is not afraid to hurt our feelings and who is going to really, really give us the genuine godly truth. It's not legalism to obey the Lord. It's the truth. I don't know who needed to hear this video today, but I really think it's for the guy or the girl who is maybe in a circle where she feels like, okay, I'm feeling convicted about these things, but I'm not sure why, but no one else in my circle does. Am I wrong? like or just like if you feel different like if you feel like society is going in one way and you want to go in another way but you're like I don't know how to do that and I don't know why society is going in another way even if society looks like other Christians like oh yeah I can be a Christian and excuse my sin and not obey the Lord no actually we can't but it's actually a beautiful thing to be like free from our sin and to not be enslaved to it and to feel convicted and to honor the Lord with our lives. I hope this video was helpful for you guys. Please comment below something that you have felt a stirring in your spirit about that you maybe have felt convicted about or maybe you had a very calloused heart towards for a while and then the Lord shifted things in your lives. I would absolutely love to know because I personally have so many examples of that, but I love you guys so much and I will see you in my video next week. Be blessed and I will see you then. Bye.